Prague 22, LGD for local gov Drupal. So bit.ly slash LGD Prague 22. I literally clicked on it earlier and it worked. No? Interesting. Let's try it. Is it not working? Bit.ly LGD Prague 22. Goes through to that for me. No? Yeah, I did. It worked for you. Okay, it works for Costas, so do what he did. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, slide, the slides, if anyone wants the slides, they are on bit.ly bit slash LGD Prague 22. So that's LGD for local gov Drupal. I realize that L might look like an I in lowercase or whatever, but LGD Prague 22. Yeah, okay. Working for some people. <laughs> I can't help with typos. Okay, it's 11.30. Let's go. <coughs> is everyone here? Great. Um, so this is uh, growing and sustaining uh, an open source Drupal distribution. Uh, in this case, local gov Drupal, which is the distribution I've had the opportunity to work with over the last couple of years. Uh, we've got, what, 45 minutes, but I'm going to try and keep it down to about 30 so that we can have some Q&A, because I think that's where uh, the best value is. Um, so who am I? For those who don't know me, I'm Finn, Finn Lewis. Uh, I'm from Oxford, England. I'm a Drupal developer, a delivery manager, and technical lead on the local gov Drupal um, project. Um, I've been working at Agile Collective since 2011. We're a, a cooperative, worker cooperative, working with Drupal for local government and uh, non-profit organizations. I also work as open code uh, doing contracting. You can find out more about Agile Collective at agile.coop. You can email me, you can Twitter me, uh, you can find me on Drupal.org. I have other passions other than uh, local gov Drupal, which includes generally open source, uh, cooperatives, people co-owning their, their own business. I think that's really important. I love sailing, uh, I love mountain biking, and I love Zumba. So tonight, Zumba, 6 p.m. at Fit Top Centre, if anyone's up for a dance. I've done it every night this week so far, so why stop now? Um, <laughs> but my motivations for this talk are mainly to share our experiences with other people, uh, and hopefully to learn from your experiences through Q&A, um, and obviously to connect, to connect with other Drupal suppliers who might be working in the area, um, to connect with other open source communities, already have some interesting conversations about Typo3, um, and to connect with people doing similar things maybe in other countries. Already heard from some people doing it in Malaysia, uh, Netherlands, etc. So um, let's yeah, talk to me um, after this or, or through Q&A. So do dis distributions, Drupal distributions, anyone who's new to Drupal who might not know what a distribution is, um, it's a full copy of Drupal that includes core with additional themes, modules, libraries, installation profiles to answer a particular need. Um, Dries mentioned it in his, uh, in his blog post in 2006, saying how important they are. I mentioned it again this week in, in his uh, Dries note. So um, it's still very much uh, you know, um, a hugely valuable part of the Drupal community, um, as is seen by lots of popular um, distributions, such as Open Social for social networking, Thunder for publishing, Opinio for learning management. Not actually tried that yet, but um, I'd like to. Varbase for rapidly building your website, um, uh, saving hundreds of hours of work, and local gov Drupal for councils in the UK, which is what I will talk more about now. Um, so yeah, local gov Drupal, it's the publishing uh, platform created by councils for councils. That's our pithy strapline. There are now 30 councils in the UK uh, signed up to use it. They're not all live yet, but um, but it is a, a growing a growing community. Um, <coughs> What it is, I realized I hadn't really explained what it is, I just threw this slide in at the last mo minute. Um, it's for the public facing websites for councils. This is Westminster City Council running on local gov Drupal. This is Waltham Forest, um, and that's Cumbria over there. So public facing websites for citizens to find out when the bin collections are coming or how to pay their council tax. Um, so the aim is to make publishing better, cheaper, uh, more efficient, more efficient use of, of taxpayers' money in the end. So, brief history. How did we get here? Good call on the water, Chris. So, 
We have had um, a significant amount of funding from the UK government to get this off the ground. Uh, in 2019, we had £75,000 to do a discovery phase. Um, this is all via the local digital fund. Um, at that point, there were four councils looking to find out whether councils could share Drupal code. The answer was yes, which is good, because that led to another £100,000 in 2020 to look at an alpha phase where we basically refactored code from Brighton and Hove City Council um, to make it fit for purpose for other councils to use, in this case, Croydon. So that established two councils sharing the code uh, and another four councils um, who were up for taking that code and, and, and starting to publish stuff with it. Uh, fast forward to 2021, we had 350,000, adding more features, looking at a scale, uh, scaling the, the, the project and the code, but also looking at a sustainable business model um, because the funding is not going to last forever. Um, and uh, 2022, this year, we're working on microsites. Um, all councils have many, many little microsites, WordPress, Wix, various technologies, trying to bring them all into one uh, platform built under local gov Drupal using domain access and uh, group module. I won't go into the technical details, but it's super exciting, still still in the middle of that. Um, and looking ahead to 2023, creating a, a non-profit organization to try and uh, nurture and grow grow the code and the, and the community. So we've had about um, nearly nearly a million pounds of worth of funding from the UK government. Not all of which has gone directly on development, but you know, lots of it in councils and other, other people's time to, to make the collaboration work. Um, but we're looking at growth really right now. Um, this is slightly out of date, but illustrates um, the councils expressing interest um, and then eventually signing the MOU. We have a memorandum of understanding, which is a non-binding document that says, we agree to collaborate, work open source, work transparent, uh, transparently, um, and uh, you know, in, in, in good faith. And so that's our sort of measure of people in the club, as it were. Um, we're now up to 30, so actually we've got a quite a few more expressions of interest. But it does illustrate that the exponential growth in the expressions of interest leads to people signing up and ultimately to, to, to new life sites. Lots of councils are participating. If you're from the UK, you might recognise some of these, but some big councils like Westminster and Essex and smaller councils, um, also from up north and down south, as well as London. And lots of lovely Drupal suppliers involved, um, including Agile Collective from, from the beginning, Anatech, um, also working uh, closely in collaboration, Zucha working with a number of councils, Code Enigma providing uh, demos and hosting to a number of councils, uh, InViews, formerly in Voltra, I think, um, Web Curl, Big Blue Door. So Drupal suppliers that we know of um, and you know, creating a, a, a good community of, of uh, yeah, Drupal suppliers, well, part of, the, part of the wider community. So just the size of the community right now, 30 councils, um, 50 further councils showing interest, 12 suppliers that we know of, about 379 roughly people in Slack at the last count, uh, twi 12 li live council sites and nearly a million pounds worth of investment from the UK government. Uh, so we have grown. It, growth has happened. Um, but now, how do we continue? How do we sustain it? Because we're not sure whether there'll be any more grant funding. And if I'm honest, I think probably not. But um, So we're looking at what to do next. In my conversations uh, around this, we've been lucky enough to have um, We Are Open Cooperative um, join us in the last few months. Uh, and this is Doug Belshaw. He's uh, previously worked at Mozilla Foundation and um, Moodle and is uh, a really interesting guy, uh, passionate about open source, passionate about communities, and he's uh, helped to form some of the ideas that I'm going to share with you now. Um, one of the things he pointed me to was this book uh, by Nadia Egbar, seeing Jam nodding his head. Uh, if you haven't read this and you're interested in open source communities, it's really good, published a couple of years ago. Um, I think Nadia used to work at GitHub, and it uh, talks a lot about the things that make a successful, a successful community. Um, another thing that Doug pointed to was an architecture of participation. Um, so this is uh, something that Tim O'Reilly coined, I think, in 2004, uh, saying that the architecture of participation is, describes the nature of systems that are designed for user contribution. Um, obviously, open source communities, but possibly other systems as well. Um, Doug has since written about this um, and formulated a sort of eight-pillar structure to the architecture of participation when looking at an open source community. Um, thinking about this, I could have uh, maybe created a more pillar-based illustration, aka Jam's talk just now, which had a nice you know, um, structure to it. 
That'd be good. We can just swap it out. Um, but anyway, eight, eight pillars. We'll just briefly go through each one. Clear mission, invitation to participate, easy onboarding, modular approach to the community and the governance, not just the, the code, strong leadership, working in the open, sort of non-worky back channels, ways of being human and celebrating milestones. Um, so this has been really useful. Um, Doug's written about it on, on a couple of blog posts on We Are Open. I'll give you links to that. In fact, you can there's a link at the bottom there. Um, but it's a useful lens through which to assess our community and how well we're doing. So I'm going to rattle through this. Um, <coughs> clear mission. Basically, I think we're quite, we're quite good on this. We, we defined a vision and a mission a while ago. Some of it's a bit wordy. Uh, our vision is 100 councils collaborating on open source software uh, based on shared evidence and user research. So evidence-based open source collaboration and 100. You know, it's kind of, uh, we'll get there, I think, but it's quite visionary at the time. We have a mission statement, a bit more wordy, to improve the digital experience uh, through evidence-based design and specifically an open source Drupal web publishing platform. That's what we're doing at the moment, and that's you know, our current mission, which may well change in the future as we, as we sort of, uh, you know, fill that out and, and move on to, to other non-Drupal things potentially. Uh, but we're not a nice pithy strapline, which is the first thing on the on the website that councils see the publishing platform created by councils for councils. So giving it that kind of sense of ownership. So I think in in general, everyone agrees we, they kind of know what we're doing as a as a community and as a project and as a product. Um, so I think we're doing doing pretty well on that. Um, the invitation to participate. This is where. We want to get people involved in the community. Um, Doug likes to distinguish between passive invitations and active invitations, um, highlighting that actually active invitations are going to lead to much more participation. So passive invitations, things like GPL, um, things like you know having GitHub open issues, issue trackers, people can just jump in and read it, um, having a good first issue tag, having documentation. But this all just sits there, you know, and people only find it if they find it, if they want to. So active invitations are things like saying, hey, we'd love to see you at the next technical group meeting to come and you know, review your, your pull requests or see if you've got any problems. Um, or please, could you provide a pull request to fix the issue? That actually happened yesterday and it worked. Um, somebody else just, you know, rather than saying there's a problem, they actually posted the pull request and, and uh, that was merged and, and released, which is great. Um, and specifically inviting people to, to join meetings so that it's in their calendar rather than just saying, hey, this is open to everyone. Say, oh, you, 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 yeah, you should all come, add the invites, and then people feel like actively, actively involved. So I think we're doing quite well on things like GitHub and some of our meetings. Merge Mondays is a regular meeting on a Monday that people come to to review merge requests and get pull requests. That's open to everyone. Uh, we're quite good at inviting councils to meetings, and uh, we have a, like a product group and a technical group, and those meetings are quite well attended. But I think we need to invite more people to meetings, especially suppliers, because we've got 12 suppliers, and there's maybe um, two or three who are regularly in some of the meetings. Um, and other ideas that we're thinking about, so sort of reflecting on the wider Drupal community, things like mentored contribution sprints, um, get people who might want to I get involved, um, involved by setting a, I don't know, a Friday morning, just jump on Slack and, and jump on a, a Zoom call and, and work out how, you know, where you might fit in. Uh, also promoting the benefits of collaboration. This is something Will mentioned yesterday when I was speaking to him, uh, Will being the sort of instigator of this project. Um, sometimes people don't realise the benefits of actually collaborating or contributing or participating, um, but actually highlighting that some of the some of the people at councils who have worked on this have uh, sort of since said this has been the most um, the most kind of professional development they've ever had by collaborating with other councils and participating in, in the collaboration of the project. So. I'm really flagging that up. So, yeah, various things we can do to improve, I think, on the uh, invitation to participate. Easy onboarding. This is, a, this is one, isn't it? People need to be onboarded into, into a community and into a, a system. Um, we have a great process for councils. We get them to sign the Memorandum of Understanding. This document, uh, that's non-binding, but sets out the kind of terms of engagement. We have an initial meeting with the product lead, who's uh, Will Callahan at the moment our benevolent dictator. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe for life, maybe not. Um, uh, a, a technical onboarding session with tech lead and developer for the tech crew. Um, signposting to documentation, active invitations to participate, getting people invited to, to tech group meetings and uh, you know that kind of stuff, and adding direct just to Slack and, and Slack channels. Um, so this is going really well for, for councils. And then I was thinking about suppliers. <laughs> And I went through all of these things and realized we don't do any of them for suppliers yet. Um, 
and uh, that was kind of like, oh, right, well, yeah, maybe that's why we don't have so many suppliers kind of like jumping into these particular meetings or, or indeed in the Slack channels <laughs> or, you know, so a lot of, lot of stuff we can, we can do better there. It just boils down to, you know, we're doing well onboarding councils. We really should onboard suppliers. I, I just did receive a, 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 an email today saying that other people are working on an onboarding checklist for suppliers. So we, we it's already in, in progress. And having spoken to a few suppliers here uh, who are already involved and who might be involved soon, it's, it's something we're going to definitely improve. Modular approach. So obviously Drupal is modular. We love modular. We love people, you know, to be able to work on different things and have optional code, optional features. Uh, but that also transcends, not transcends, but transmutes, applies to community and governance uh, as well. Um, so, oh, look, got two tiles. Sorry. Old one and a new one. All right. Um, so we have something called sociocracy, which is how our governance is structured. Um, essentially circle-based uh, governance, um, rather than a sort of direct hierarchy. Uh, and this leads to a kind of modular governance structure. Um, we have things you might expect, a product group in charge of like product and product direction and roadmap and features, uh, requests from councils, and a technical group more in charge with delivering that, building it, overseeing the security, performance, quality control, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. In the middle, we have a steering group where people are more in, in, in engaged in the strategy and direction of the organisation and the, the, the community, uh, you know, and the project as a whole. And then off the back, off the sort of end of it, all around, we have working groups, which is usually time bound uh, around a particular a particular thing. Communications working group, I think, is probably not time bound, but forms, publications, workflow. These are particular features that people work on, um, and each of these represents a person. So people will be involved in maybe just a working group or maybe a working group and the product group or maybe the steering group and the product group. And there's links between all of the, all of the circles. Uh, there's links to more about sociocracy in the slides. Actually, there might not be, but I can put some in. Um, but what the point of this is, that different people have different skills, needs, um, time, uh, aspirations. And so by acknowledging who they are, what type of person they are, we may steer them to get involved with different areas of, of the community. Um, <coughs> so again, we are open, have been doing lots of work on this. Laura Hilliger has developed this, um, this kind of flow of different people to kind of visualize people coming into the community. They might be a designer, they might start by reading the docs, they might do some style guide stuff, they might start doing some contribution and then end up coming into the product group in a sort of uh, design guidance capacity that might equally end up going into the steering group or or maybe some one of the sub working groups um, product managers equally may end up in product group developers maybe more technical group and um, that's just a few but you know different types of people um, may well uh, want to end up in different places so I think our governance structure really lends itself to that um, modular approach to the community um, similarly slack channels there are groups for different groups channels for different groups um, so again you know um, technical group, steering group, product group, but also the actual working group. So the people can actually see what's happening, jump into those if they want and, and get involved. Um, so I think that coupled with the onboarding helps to, yeah, people to participate in the areas that they want to want to participate in or where they're going to be most valuable. So we're doing quite well at product groups and working groups. Um, I think maybe more specific Slack channels might be useful. There's a few gaps there. Um, we'd like to assess people's interests at onboarding and maybe flag them up to particular areas, trying to sort of do a bit of uh, more matchmaking is what Will called it. Uh, so, oh, you'd be really good over here and you should talk to this person and actually just try and get people to, you know, sort of engage uh, in the places where they're going to have most fun. And uh, more in-person meetings, so like when new people come and join, actually just jump on a call with them, jump on a Zoom call, have a chat, find out where, where best they, they might fit. So, um, so, yeah, more on that in the future. Leadership. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Mentioned, I mentioned Will, uh, our benevolent dictator for life. Um, he, th he's great. He's, he, he started this all off. He had a vision. He had a history of open source software. He, he, he worked in government digital service at the UK. He had lots of experience with Drupal, working with Brighton and Hove, saw an opportunity not to reinvent the wheel, um, had a vision, had a belief, had good connections, very persuasive, and managed to tap into some funding in order to make it happen. Um, so we really kicked it off and, uh, and you know, uh, when the tender went out to say, hey, we're looking for a technical partner, of course, Agile Collective jumped at the chance and said, this sounds great. It also sounds like it really links in with our open source principles and our cooperative knowledge. Um, so 
this started to build build out the sort of leadership team in a way. Um, so Will plus people from Agile Collective, adding a, a product lead. Well, Will's product lead, adding a technical lead, um, adding cooperative governance experience and legal and open source experience in the form of Andrew Katz, who's our favourite open source lawyer. Um, so really starting to distribute the leadership and strengthen it, I think. Um, as we move up to beta, we've got more councils, more suppliers. Um, we move to the sociocracy in the circles that I showed you the diagram a minute ago, um, a steering group with councils and suppliers on it. And so we're really starting to distribute the leadership um, and, and the power uh, amongst people across a series of circles. Um, put some faces on here just to so you can see that you know some people are involved in steering group and product group, some people are technical group and steering group, and there's th these you know double links between each circle to really inc uh, make sure there's communication and information flowing between the, the areas of the of the governance. So that's kind of where we are. Um, I think looking ahead, um, we're probably going to continue this sociocracy, but actually provide a bit more training to people in the community. It's quite new to a lot of people. Uh, I think it's important to understand some of the basic principles of sociocracy and um, decision-making processes uh, around uh, consent, rather the consensus, um, allowing decisions to happen. Uh, we want to define community work roles a lot better. Again, uh, Nadia's book uh, is very, you know, very specific around users, contributors, maintainers, and how they're quite different in different communities. And I'm kind of used to it from the, what the Drupal community, but we need to be specific about what it is within our, our community and, and, and indeed assign those roles to people because actually at the moment we don't necessarily assign maintainers to each project. And we've got about 30 projects on GitHub. So these are things that we can definitely strengthen uh, the leadership and the distribution of the leadership and the distribution of power, which hopefully will then empower contributors and maintainers to lead within, within their areas. Anyway, ideas for uh, leadership 1.0, I guess, once we establish uh, ourselves next year. Um, <coughs> this kind of structure can lead to slower movement, or slower decision making. Um, and this is something that Lambeth Council's Paul Tate shared um, when we were discussing this. And if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So the idea that actually we might make better decisions if we take time to discuss them and hear everyone's voices. And uh, the eponymous Finley Quay <laughs> also said, good things happen slowly, bad things happen fast. I mean, you said a lot of things, but... <laughs> um, ways of working open. So this is obviously intrinsic to, to Drupal and open source and, and, and indeed agile collective and cooperative ways, but um, openness and transparency are, are super important um, to us. It's part of the local digital declaration that anyone working on a project which is funded by it should publish everything openly. So um, that's been great from the start. We do publish sprint notes, share outputs from meetings, uh, regular updates at product groups, uh, technical group meetings, uh, and Merge Mondays are open to anyone. So I think we're, we're pretty good at the general transparency and, and openness. All the codes on GitHub made that a bit more welcoming recently to kind of engage people and signpost them to different directions. There's a roadmap on Trello, which apparently needs a bit of an update, but again, just trying to be open and transparent. Lots of councils are sharing their design guidelines and the way that they work and content strategy stuff with each other. So again, feeding that openness out to the participants of, th of the project. We've got open meeting schedules on the website so everyone can see where there are meetings. And importantly, maybe we need a bigger link, but a shared Google Calendar so that people can go and see where meetings are, find the links to those meetings and join those meetings uh, you know, without necessarily needing to be invited. A passive, passive invitation to, to participate. Um, but anyway, that openness and transparency, I think we're, we're pretty good at. Something else we are open, uh, uh, Doug mentions, um, is openness is all well and good, but without ambition, no one cares. <laughs> so you can be as open as you want and no one's going to look at it. Um, if you're really ambitious and trying to do something really big and good, but actually you're not very open, then people get suspicious. But if you combine the two, people are excited and they, they want to get involved. And, and so I think that's, that's, that's a useful thing to, to, to hang on to. You know, we're being open... But we also need to sort of shout about the, the our plans and, and be really ambitious. Um, so yeah, we're doing well. Newsletter also. We've got Show Your Work Slack channel. That's actually really interesting. Councils regularly sharing their work. Um, but we want to improve things. Um, roadmap I've mentioned. Be more responsive to our users. I think issue queues, questions in Slack. Um, sometimes they just hang around for a bit. I think being responsive is, is probably, you know, part of, of transparency rather you know sharing information as quickly as possible and finances is a really interesting one something I think we're not 
I don't. I, I think there's information there that is available if you go and reach around and look for it. But actually, being actively transparent on our finances and how that's working, there's something called the Open Collective, which I recommend anyone to have a look at. Is a way to um, either host your fiscal sort of bank account stuff with them or host it yourself, but be transparent about where the money's coming from, where the money's going, and people can just go and drill into that and the visual representations around um, what's happening with your money, which I think in a non-profit organisation where money is changing hands is really important, um, and especially in, in, a, in an open source community. So where are we up to? Backwater channels. No, I always say that, backwater, because I just think of backwaters. Back channels and water coolers. You know, the non-work kind of human interaction part, also really important. Um, these days, obviously, we're mostly remote. Um, we do check-ins and check-outs. This is part of sociocracy sort of um, sort of culture. Beginning of a meeting, everyone just checks in. Unless there's maybe more than ten people, and there's not not time. But in, in smaller meetings, how are you? What are you bring into the meeting? You know, well, my cat's really ill, so I'm a bit worried actually, and I'm quite tired because you know. Um, and check-outs, you know, how did the meeting go? This really kind of brings people, the sort of whole human, to to the meeting. Um, social meetups, we've done a couple. We've got local gov camp next week. DrupalCon is great because <laughs> you get to meet people. Um, Drupal meetups in Oxford as well. And various one-to-one check-ins, just quick calls with people. Actually, one-to-one, -one, having a quick chat, I think really helps to, to, uh, to, yeah, to, to bond uh, people, chat about things non-worky. Non things to work on. More Slack channels. Something, um, just chatting to Anatech, who, who we're working closely with, Mark was saying, you know, they have book club, exercise and well-being, rant. I'd love to see that channel. <laughs> um, <laughs> foodies. Uh, so maybe we should look at doing that kind of thing as well. Uh, it may be slightly different in a company where you've got a safe space where, where you know, 400 Slack channels of suppliers and, and, and uh, councils, but, you know, we'll see. Um, and social Zoom calls, just like a random Zoom call, say, hey, we're just going to have a chat. It's not about anything particular. Do you want to come and say hello? So I think these kind of things we can, you know, hopefully uh, do. And shared Spotify playlists. Interesting idea. Um, Milestones. We already mentioned uh, this sticker on my on my laptop at the, at the beginning. Um, everyone likes stickers. Um, project milestones, community milestones, personal milestones. So yeah, new releases should be celebrated. Uh, we had a sticker for each uh, sort of patch, uh, um, a sticker mission mission patch they called aren't they for each uh, phase of the project. Uh, that's one of them on my laptop. Don't know where the other ones are actually. Um, Community milestones, hey, we just hit 30 councils, let's celebrate it in some way, you know, actually, actually do that. Um, and then personal milestones, you know, someone's just got their Zimbra instructor badge or something like that, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> something random. Um, so, uh, yeah, stickers, I think, are great, uh, physical stickers, but also digital stickers. Um, open badges, has anyone heard of open badges? Okay, so it's a thing... I first heard about it maybe 10 years ago through Rachel Lawson at a Drupal Camp Cambridge. Um, what I didn't realise is that... Um, do you remember that? <laughs> uh, what I didn't realise is that at the same time at Mozilla Foundation, uh, Doug from We Are Open was working on open badges on that side. So he's super super championing these and bring, bringing these into to the local Drupal community. Things like once you become a member, you get a, a digital badge. You know, if you're on the steering committee, you get a digital badge. And so finally, you know, people are getting recognition for the participation that they are taking. And we can create our own badges as much as possible. So I'm super excited about that. There's more information on the We Are Open blog, so do check that out. So yeah, architectural participation, a really useful lens through which to look at various aspects of, of your open source community. I think we're doing pretty well on lots of them, and there's lots of room for improvement on, on some of them, for sure. Um, one thing I didn't mention was a code of conduct. Um, this was highlighted at uh, Anna's talk, I think, on Tuesday uh, about uh, starting the Lagoon open source community. And it reminded me about our code of conduct, which we do have, thankfully, on the website. Um, and this uh, comes from the con contributorcovenant.org, uh, which is a, a useful place to have a Creative Commons open source GPO um, starting point, boilerplate for your code of conduct. So if you need one quickly, you can go there, take it, adapt it, um, and uh, yeah. It's important to have it in place before you need it, I think, because as communities grow, if you have problems or if you get any bad eggs, you need a, a structured process and you know a safe channel of communication to, to flag that. So I'm super happy that that was mentioned uh, on Tuesday and reminded me to mention it. Now money, that's the other big one, right? So we've had lots of funding so far, um, and that's helped us get to where we are but that's not going to last forever. So we're looking at developing a, a source of income um, uh, over the next, well, 
pretty soon, really, hopefully by the end of the year. What do we need money for, though? We need money for a community manager. We have a community manager in place now. Uh, he's just been in place for like a couple of months, so it's like er early days. Um, we also need someone who's like product manager, product lead to kind of sort of own that space and, and lead that. We, we need technical management, technical know-how, uh, technical time, as well as developers and communications people. I mean, probably more, but you know, a, a sort of skeleton crew of uh, probably part-time positions um, that does cost money and then we need, you know, um, we can't really rely on, on volunteer help. Well, solely on volunteer help or, or indeed from people who are employed by councils. Um, so, what does this look like cost-wise? Um, our current fag packet calculations um, suggest £200,000 a year to like maintain the community and code as it is and just kind of keep on keeping on. Um, I think as, as it grows, that... that that may, may grow as well. And roughly the same if we want to actually do active feature development, like build a new, I don't know, like another microsites project or do a headless project or extend the product in, in, in serious ways. Um, so maybe £400,000 a year total is what we'd be looking for, you know, within the next few years. And our business plan has got like a five-year uh, projection by which time we're, we're, we're looking to exceed that. Um, so we're setting up a non-profit legal entity, maybe the local GovDrupal Federation, quite like the word federation. Uh, name to be name to be decided, um, through which we can channel money uh, in order to pay for some of these core co you know, coordination roles. Um, the mechanisms are council subscriptions, so people who councils who are using the software uh, to basically become a member of the of the local gov Drupal Federation. Uh, supplier subscriptions, similarly, um, and maybe sponsorship from larger companies, possibly further grants. But the first two are, are ones that we're kind of more sure about right now. I won't go over this slide in detail, but there's lots of member benefits for councils that we're kind of using to sell, sell this concept in, into, in, into the councils and the decision making. Um, but mainly, um, the, the kind of collaboration pieces seems to be what is actually most valuable to councils, people learning from their peers in other councils. Um, good examples are like content designers who sit in a council writing content actually haven't spoken to any other content designers. And as soon as they're collaborating with a few councils, they've got peers, they've got a little crew of people they can actually share ideas with. Um, Another thing that happened recently was the Queen died. Uh, the day before the Queen died, lots of people were in the meeting and said, oh, hey, Operation London Bridge, are you ready for that? Oh, no, what have you got? Oh, and they started sharing lots of information about you know, what they're going to do should the Queen die. Um, when she did die, we noticed, well, Eeks noticed, that uh, most of the local GovDrupal sites responded like that with a full page <laughs> banner ready to go and they had you know because they've been sharing information and because they've been collaborating on, lo on local gov so um so interesting benefits to, to to being involved in the community uh similarly suppliers lead generation being involved in the direction of the project as well um so there's lots of reasons why you might want to contribute financially to the project um so so far we have 12 councils who have pledged to contribute and seven suppliers have pledged to contribute uh, when we set up a when we've got a bank account basically should probably be January, um, which is £125,000 so far. So that's pretty good. That's on the way to our sort of £200,000 keeping the lights on, but uh, but not quite there. Um, however, there's kind of pipeline. There's of the 11 councils who have said yes, there's another five who are asking managers, another three who we consider likely. So we can see that, you know, continuing to grow. So I've, I've got, you know, optimistic confidence that, that we're going to, uh, you know, have enough money to, to carry on. Um, other other models, uh, other ways, other sources of funding, sponsorship from larger companies. We've got a few companies already sort of uh, in discussion with with sponsorship, trying to work out what that means for an open source project without kind of, uh, I guess, accidentally recommending somebody's proprietary service just because they've given us lots of money. So like working out what the balance there is of of taking money, having logos on, but but you know in in a sort of hands off kind of way. Um, maybe grant funding for other specific features. Um, and maybe donations from other members of the community. This is something that actually I was quite interested in. Another thing that uh, Doug from We Are Open put me onto, Jeffrey McDougall, great name. Um, um, he talks about small dollar fundraising. I think he was at Mozilla at the foundation at the time, looking at, I think once they're getting away from their grant funding or the grant funding died up and how lots of little bits of money from lots of people is much more stable, mitigates risk. Um, and there's also a meaningful contribution path for those who don't have time or capacity to to contribute in other ways. So while we're probably not talking about end users in, you know, like sort of citizens like, uh, you know, Joe Bloggs in, in Barnsley or something, um, I think that's interesting to th just think about that concept of lots of small amounts of money rather than fewer bigger amounts of money to try and develop a sustainable income stream. I guess 
uh, that's something that the Drupal Association obviously does as well through, uh, through our individual uh, memberships. So income streams, council membership, supplier membership, sponsorship deals, grants, smaller donations. I think we've got some good options. So my conclusions are from this that grant funding or seed funding helps massively with the growth of an open source project. I don't think it would have happened quite in the same way or at the same speed without it. The architecture of participation is super helpful to look at your community and assess where you might want to make improvements. Code of conduct is crucial, of course, and ongoing funding is important, um, hopefully through a sustainable distribution of smaller amounts. Through these discussions this week, I have sort of only just realized, I guess, that the local gov Drupal community is just a microcosm of the wider Drupal community, um, which is obvious, I guess, if you think about it, but that gives us great, that gives me, well, you know, all of us great kind of opportunity to look at the problems and the solutions that the Drupal community have had over the last 20 years and apply them to our, our smaller community and vice versa, try things out in our smaller community and maybe scale them out to the Drupal community. Similarly to that, the non-profi, Local Gov Drupal Federation, non-profit, I should say, has a very similar aims and challenges as the Drupal Association on a different scale, right? We're trying to ra raise money, we're trying to look after an open source community, we're trying to uh, look after the, the tech behind the product. Um, and so I'm sure we've got lots to learn from the Drupal Association. And similarly, if we do things that actually work, maybe we can feed those back up to the Drupal Association as well. So that's really only just occurred to me through conversations with, uh, with, with other suppliers and Drupal people here this week. Um, but yeah, interesting. So credits, Doug and Laura at uh, We Are Open. Um, check them out. They've got lots of good stuff to say. Aaron Hertenstein, now that's our beloved community manager, doing great work. Uh, Mark Conroy, EX, Maria Young, Stephen Cox on the team of Local Gov Drupal Dev and Microsites at the moment. Um, always, always a joy to work with and great input into into this talk. Will Callahan, our benevolent dictator for life, I hope. Um, Stella Power from Anatech has some good things to say. As did Greg. As did, as did Will from Code Enigma. Sorry, I should say just just because you're there, I was pointing <laughs> you. Um, and Will Huggins from Zucho is another supplier. Uh, lots of great input into into the sort of supplier side of, of the community. So um, some links and references there if you want. Um, and yeah, get in touch. You've got contact details there. Um, might you work with other councils or local government in the UK? Would you like to get involved with local gov Drupal anyway? Uh, might you work on something similar in another country? You've only met a couple of people who do, but I think that's a massive opportunity to collaborate between countries who have very similar needs. You know, let's not reinvent wheels. Let's collaborate in every way. Um, and do you see parallels with other, other open source communities like the Typo3 community uh, or others? So let's, again, learn from each other in that way. Um, so yeah, that's it. Let's, uh, let's, let's move to any questions, if you have any. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Do I take credit cards? Yeah. What for Zumba? <laughs> Hello. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, seems to be a f success story from from the very start. Um, I was wondering if you have. Uh, been looking what other countries are doing that have similar initiatives like in Germany and Australia uh, and the second question is um, if a country or if someone let's say Norway for, <laughs> for our, our case um, would it be um, interesting for us or s to start with local gov distribution would that be possible or do you think it's better to start from scratch Good questions. Um, so when the first one, did we look at other uh, what other people are doing? Yes, but maybe not until a bit late in the game. So uh, we looked at Australia, the Australia government um, open source distribution. I think at the point at which we were developing, that was still on Drupal 7 and hadn't got Drupal 8 release, and that was one thing. We looked at DEGov, and I think that was less for local governments and more for institutions in central government, um, and there was uh, you know enough difference there that it didn't you know, it was wasn't necessarily directly applicable the other thing that happened was a website had been built at a council in the uk and they had gone through all of the design decisions invested in user research and invested a couple of hundred grand in building you know a website for, for brighton and hove and then they were going to do the same thing at another council so we had a model we had structures we had 
information architectures that were working and had been tested and uh, you know taxonomies that kind of worked and, and uh, the structure of services is quite specific I guess in, in councils in the UK so we we had what we needed we just needed to make it into a distribution and and you know it wasn't sort of starting from scratch um, so it was easier to, to go down that route and refactor that code for, for, for reuse um, the second question, like, yeah, I, would it work in Norway? Uh, why not? I mean, definitely the first thing is to try it, have a look and see, you know, are there any fundamental architectural decisions that wouldn't work for a local government or a council in Norway? I guess councils work in different ways in different countries, so that's a thing. Um, but in, in our country, you know, all, all councils have bin collections, all councils take council tax, all councils have sort of children's services and adult special educational need services and things that they need to supply. And so similar design patterns work across them. Whether those same design patterns will work in a different country will be interesting to see. But maybe the fundamental structures are good, then the modular approach is, is slightly different. Absolutely. I think just another uh, thing, an extension to the question of applicability in different countries. The microsites project that we're working on now is like a separate installation distribution uh, based on a lot of the same fundamental design patterns, content types uh, in local GovDrupal, but it's for lots of different smaller sites. And so that pattern, I think, would be applicable anywhere, you know, using domain access and group module to have one site that's controlling 70 of your microsites. Um, the specific designs of them or... I don't think we've brought in multilingual yet, for example. Um, you know, things to look at. But yeah, I think that'd be worth definitely worth looking at. Do we have a question over here? Um, Actually, my question was kind of answered because I'm I'm in a weird situation having um, work in the UK, but then living in France, and I was wondering how applicable that would be to councils in other parts of the world, which you've kind of addressed already. But um, I think will be what will be interesting is what we were talking about um, with recipes. So I think uh, I can see a future for local gov Drupal where right now maybe you get an, an install profile that, that has a load of stuff that you don't want if you're a French local government or something, but in the future, maybe that, that's the way things will go. So if you're a French uh, government or a Norwegian government or whatever, you can actually say, oh, I don't want that and that and that because it's too UK-centric, but all this other cool stuff I'll have, please. So. A pick and mix distribution based on the recipes a absolutely and the whole if people don't know that the recipes initiative kind of distributions initiative streamlining what a distribution is by kind of removing the profile which is a bit of a weird concept to allow multiple recipes to work together and we're looking at maybe trying that Are yeah, we gonna? Just <laughs> i might as well just do the techie <laughs> follow-up on that yeah it already works as a recipe oh you've done it <laughs> <laughs> um with what's what's there um and but it's already made so that you can install the modules without actually installing the profile so if you just want the directories just take the directories module don't take anything else um and i think an attack have already done the same with some irish councils so 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 yeah yeah it has already been used in ireland uh, as far as i know is this someone from Anatech to answer that or <laughs> Yeah, I was a little bit late to the party here, um, but um, how do you persuade uh, political decision makers to uh, onboard on the project? So how do we persuade like uh, councils to join us? Yes. Um, we show them a website which <laughs> lists all of the <laughs> all of the things that they could possibly answer. Um, no, I mean that. Yeah, basically, it does start with the, with the website, and we need to do a bit more proactive. Um, um, uh, uh, sales, but you know, the first thing is they come to the website, they see there's 30 other councils doing it, so they hey, you know, there's 30 councils doing it, why shouldn't we? Um, and there's a list of like um, savings, I think, for councils. Let's have a look, you know, um, you know, quotes from people saying, you know, improve service, save money, reduce risk, take control of your digital assets, keep pace with change. I mean, there's lots of good reasons to do it, and there's lots of people who are doing it and love it. Um, when you've got thought leaders like Neil William Williams, who used to be head of Gov UK, saying these kind of things, then 
it's quite a good sell, really. It's quite an easy sell. But it's, it's, it's not Microsoft, and there's not, you know, it's open source. It's like they haven't got a, they haven't got a, a automatic, uh, what do you call it? What do you get with proprietary software? A sort of <laughs> a thing, a contract, you know. Um, I'm so out of the loop with <laughs> proprietary. An SLA, you know, uh, obviously you can get that, but it's a whole different thing. So there is a problem with procurement. There is a problem with convincing pr certain procurement, uh, certain councils that actually open source is a thing still. I sort of thought we'd won that battle, but <laughs> some people are still haven't heard the news yet. So it's a good question. But is, is there information on this page and the page that you were on before, the information that you need to do the convincing is, is absolutely there. Um, nobody wants to be the first. And if, if, if a dozen are live and 30 more are coming, I know it works for my peers and they can go and click through and they can call them because I guarantee they know each other. And the most important thing on the front page, if they're convinced that it can work, is the cost reduction, right? Because everybody has a mission to be responsible with the money right now. Well, and always. I was also quite impressed, because I've not been involved in this end of this at all. I was impressed by the way the memorandum of understanding is written. Um, so it's kind of... It, because it's non-binding, but it is it very encouraging about what it would offer and how it would offer it. And it means that the higher-ups just authorise the people who are actually doing the stuff to then go out and collaborate. So once it's been agreed by the higher-ups, people can get on and do their job. <laughs> so by getting the councils to sign this memorandum of understanding is actually probably a really good way of doing it, I think. Yeah, this is, yeah, absolutely. Um, more questions? Yeah, and great presentation, first of all. Thank uh, you. And uh, it's a little bit maybe technical question. I was wondering, uh, you have like 30 different consoles on board at the moment, and uh, what happens if one of the consoles ask for a new feature? You know, like, yeah, we want this, and the rest doesn't. So would you just provide that for that certain uh, console, and then... I don't know, build them uh, differently or you just provide it and then open source it and add it to the 30 other. And uh, that's the first question. And the second one is what's the routine and the process of uh, deploying new features if, uh, well, you want to add a new one since it's a distribution, you know, so. So the, f the first question is, is, is around, uh, yeah, what happens if a council wants a new feature? Um, hopefully somebody from that council will be part of the product group and will be discussing that feature with other people in the product group. And usually what happens is if there's a feature that is not there that one council wants, there's at least one other council that wants it as well. So as soon as there's two councils that want it, that's super valuable to develop it because we're going to halve the costs, right? If there's only one, then yeah, maybe it's a discussion and, uh, you know, do they have development resource at their council? What do they need help with? Um, and then we, p we set up a working group around it. So there's a feature, we go, okay, this, this is wanted. Uh, we've got some dev resource from your council. We've put some dev resource from somewhere else. You know, people say how much time they've got. Somebody like Eeks might say, well, actually, that's, that's going to take a few days' work. And so we kind of know roughly the size of the, you know, the, the, the project. Um, uh, and and we, we establish a working group to, to see that through. That will usually have some input from the product group and somebody from the technical group, you know, some council-based people to guide the actual functionality and lead the kind of like user need and hopefully have some evidence for the feature. That's something that I think we're, we're trying to get better at, documenting why it's designed in a certain way. And then build it, test it, you know, get it, get it in, into, the, into the distribution. Either into the distribution as default, if it's something that's just super needed, like we want the WYSIWYG to be much better or accessibility controls across the board. Or if it's an optional feature, have it as a kind of contrib module, if you like, or a contrib set of features to, to bring in. So if it, 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 the answer is it varies, but Waltham Forest like led on the workflow stuff and they had developers on their side and we had some input from our side, but they provided a lot of resource and a lot of guidance and just brought in this whole kind of workflow system. Um, so yeah, it, it, it works. It works so far. What was the second question? <laughs> yeah. Oh, deployment of updates. Um, so we don't deal with any of the kind of like hosting or... Oh no, what do you mean? Do you mean like, so if the... Do you mean like if the configuration is changing within our distribution? Yeah, it could be the configuration or a new feature or whatnot. So, yeah, I so mean, imagine if you develop a new feature and you want to enroll it to all the 30 different consoles, you know. E yeah. Um, Eeks, can you answer that one? <laughs> uh, 
So because it's based around modules, um, if and 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 councils are encouraged that if they want to change a content type or whatever, there's guidance for the way to do it. Um, so we're just running, literally just running updates to check to see if the configuration has changed. If it's something that's agreed that it should go out to all the all the existing sites, then we check to see if the configuration has changed. If it has, we push it out. Lots of stuff. It's just new stuff, um, and it doesn't get pushed out. And if people want to deploy it, they need to add it to their site. And then, or it's a completely new module, and it's for them to add the module and update it. And that information is just shared, actually, using the Slack and using the newsletters. And people know that it's been in development in the product group. But yes, yeah, so stuff like the workflow went out to everyone, but they had to switch it on. Um, the forms is a completely separate module. Um, it's not even gone into the distribution, and it was developed largely by Croydon. So yeah, it's it's really more based on modules and it updates like modules would update. And I guess there's the, the, the kind of what you touched on there is that up to now distributions have been either sort of starter kit or sort of fully functioning uh, and not meant to be changed. So like open social uh, is more on that end, uh, whereas we've been more on this end as, as a starter kit and not, you know, and assuming that people are going to evolve. You know, we're trying to get people 80% of the way there and then they're going to take it to where they need it to go. And so not assuming that we're going to change much of the default configuration if possible. There was one time we had to change field names and that was a real pain. <laughs> <laughs> naming things, naming things. Yeah, um, um, about your internal community building, the two most popular Slack channels at OSP are called Coffee Break, which is memes and jokes basically. Um, and we have a gratitude channel. So, you know, thanks, Tracy, for having the most awesome idea or helping me through my day or like, oh, my God, the client said such and such to us. So thank you, John, for taking care of that. Um, and we have a really we do we, we do a gratitude statement at the beginning of all the team meetings, which comes from positive psychology. But um, just saying thank you a lot is super powerful. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is that is really good. That is that is really good. And, and and I think something I try to channel in in like contribution notes, like the pull requests. You know, actually just like thanking people for it, like not just going yes, great, like saying hey, thanks. That this is really great. Like it's and it's going in. Um, but I think that I like that idea of uh, those extra channels and and yeah, upping that game. You know, spread the love. Any further questions, or should we? Should we oh, we got one over here. So I'm from Malaysia, so if I want to uh, implement this in my country, uh, does the funding go with it also? So I agree. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, I mean, what is, sorry, I'm just kidding. So what is actually the best way to start uh, if I'm from another country? I mean, I mean, it would be, I, I have no idea what the, you know, potential funding sources from government are, but this is something that, the economists who are part of the ministry that provided the funding helped us to work up the business argument for how much money this would save the public sector by investing in open source. And it was uh, some of my earlier talks from maybe two years ago at um, DrupalCon Remote or whatever it's called, um, had some figures on that. And, you know, it was looking at sort of saving 50 million euros over a, a, a sort of five-year period. And that was on the basis of uh, maybe 30 or 40 councils or something. The amount of money people spend on websites, maybe in the UK, not sure what it's like in Malaysia, you know, it, it, it's quite a lot. And often we're doing the same thing, answering the same questions at least, maybe in slightly different ways. So by bringing that into a consistency and sharing code, the, the potential cost savings for the public purse are high. So that's an argument for providing funding from the public sector in the first place to get these projects off the ground. So I don't know if you have any contacts in central government or local government in Malaysia, uh, or if there's any similar types of initiatives where they're looking at funding open source projects to do things better and cheaper, but that would be a really good thing to try and tap into. And if not, I don't know, like why not? Try and start something, try and find someone, you know. It just needs a couple of people. I think Will said, or Neil Lawrence said, um, the first person has the idea, and that's not the person that counts. It's the second person who says, yes, that's a really good idea. And then there's people that start the start of a community, right? So find some other like-minded people and start to make it happen. And totally reach out to other distributions and stuff if, if you're looking at specifically Drupal distributions to learn and collaborate from what we've done, just like we have from Thunder and Open Social, and you know, to make the tech side of it easier. But it's good to try and get some funding. And it makes sense. Yeah. So 
yeah, good luck and keep in touch and we'll see what we can do to help. Any more for any more? Or shall we go and do whatever's next? Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>